<laughs> Hi, Kevin, how are you? Just Lane, how are you doing? Okay. How about you? Did you solve your your terminal into the Linux machine on AWS? Oh, I I haven't I haven't tried yet. Is that is that for the lab today or? Yeah, I built it into the lab today. Oh, well, I haven't I haven't tried it. I barely just got in. I barely just uh, turned in the um, the lab. The, this week's assignment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, I'll walk you guys over it because, you know, I tested it and everything should work unless there's some, you, if you have firewall rule that blocks it. Okay. So, hi, Michelle, how are you doing? Let me turn on my EC2 right here. Um, check out the lab. And then we'll start in a minute. Okay. Hi, Bardo. How are you doing? Okay. I don't know if the other ones will be joining us in that. Um, let's see. I know that they might have like physics tests or whatever that's going on. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you're you going to be sore for today. The second one is actually worse than the first one, but just drink a lot of water. It's going to help. Okay, so let's talk about what we have to do for the lab today. And um, I, you know, I want to walk you through the process. So I know some of you are having challenges connecting to your instance on AWS with the other class. So I want to take this opportunity and kind of show you a little bit along with um, getting AWS CLI working. So um, let me get my, it's been busy today, so. Okay. So we are doing lab 10 and in lab 10, um, we basically are working on, we are working on AWS CLI, but I wanted to use this opportunity to show you how you can connect to your instance. Um, some of the challenges you might be having. So hold on one second, let me get to my share screen here. Okay, so in the lab for today, you will find it. I hope you can download it. Um, Canvas was acting funny this morning and I had to upload it twice. <clears throat> So the lab, you can find that here and you can download or you can have, you can view within. But in this one, you will need to have um, your AWS account ready. So I'm gonna walk you through what we need to do, okay? So if you are uh, 
I mainly wrote this with Windows 10 operating system, but if you're using Mac OS or Linux, you need to check out the user guide, which you can, you can find the link here. And so this walks you through how to install and we are gonna use version two of the CLI um, because version two would support Windows environment. And so the Windows instructions and the download, all of that is here. The Mac OS is here, Linux is here, and if you're using Docker is there. Um, after you download and install, you will need to configure AWS. So I put the requirements down and part of the assignments were just to sign up. So you can sign up for the free tier, which gives you a little bit of time. And after you use it, you can stop your instance if you don't need it. So that way it doesn't accumulate the hours. But, um, you know, or you, if you need to, to leave it running for your other class, you can. So the first thing that we would need to do is we are going to download the MSI installer for Windows. Sorry. I think I might. So if you click here. It actually walks you through how to um, go through and install. So the MSI version is located here. So if you click Windows and scroll down, it shows you the version two here, okay? And then when you click that, you will get the MSI file downloaded. So once you have that, then you will go to your download folders. I have twice. So um, what you will need to do is you can open this and it will go through the wizard. I, I already have mine installed, but you're gonna keep everything default. After after you install, if you wanted to know where it is, you would go to your C drive and under program files, um, you will find, you will find Amazon here, okay? Now, the, all the files that you need, including the executable, which will allow you to work with Python, as you can see. Um, it even has some of the Python file module for uh, Socket, SQLite 3, et cetera. And you will be able to find that there. So the CLI, the CLI areas is here for customizations topics. So, but after we installed it, what you need to do is you will need to um, link it, okay? So we wanted to verify the version of AWS. And if you open up the command prompt, you don't have to change the path or anything like that because we would need to make sure that it is in the, it is there. Okay, so you would they say where AWS and it would tell you the path of it as you notice that it's in C drive programs, files, Amazon, AWS, CLI v2 and the executable is here. Okay, now this is the path that you need to be able to put it into your environment path because it doesn't automatically launch it for the user account you use to log into your Windows environment. So we have to set the user environment variable. Um, now, if, if you change the, the path while you are doing the installation, then you have to put in that specific path. But when I use the wizard to install AWS CLI v2, I kept everything the same as default, okay? So after I checked 
the path for AWS, I would then take a screen capture of my command prompt. The reason why I wanted you to do that is so that way you know where it is, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, then next we are gonna put in environment variables and as you type it, you would see that it's going to give you the control panel options, which is part of the system properties. Okay, so you would get this. Now, what we want to do is similar to what we've done with GraphViz, we want to click on environment variables. Okay. And in GraphViz, we modify the top and the bottom. On this one, you only need to click on the path under the user, the user variables, which is at the top, and you're gonna click edit. And you notice that I put in my path here. So you will not have that if you don't, if you haven't specified a path in the, your user var environment variables. So what you need to do is you need to click new, and then you can add the path from what you see here, okay? So you can simply put C program files, Amazon, AWS, you know, the folder where it will be able to find the executable. After you do that, then you click okay, and then okay again, and then okay again. Any question? So importantly, that path needs to be there for AWS CLI to work on your Windows system. Now in Linux and Mac OS, slightly different procedure. You don't have to set environment variables on those type of systems. So if you follow the instructions that Amazon provides, you should be able to install on your Mac OS and on your Linux release operating system, okay? So once I put in the environment variable, I'm gonna go ahead and click okay three times. Okay, so the path that you wanted to specify is here. I type that out for you. And then, Basically, so far from step one through 10, what we're doing is just we're installing AWS CLI on our computer. Then we set environment variables. So that way we, we can launch the application when we're on as the current user. then you would need to log into your AWS Management Console, okay? And you can log in as a root user for now. We can um, create the user account. The reason why I wanna recreate another user account because if you didn't record your secret key and things like that previously, um, you won't be able to achieve the, the, the next few steps, okay? And you can always remove the user or disable the user and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to my I am So there are two areas in AWS. One area, the book touched on quite a bit. This is identity and access management for the cloud. The other area is for the other services. Okay, yep.
Okay. So I dropped a link there for Michelle, but if you need it, you can find that there. So in, in identity access management, we briefly touch on this when we were doing the lecture. Um, you use this to manage your user groups um, policy for your users and groups and anything that relates to authentication that happens here. Okay. Then you are gonna click on the users. And so I had created various users here, um, but this particular users were created just to test your lab. So we, so you simply click users on the left and then you are gonna add the user just very much like what we've done before. So let's say that we can say lab 10 user. Okay, make sure we check programmatic access, AWS management console access. We can have it on our automate honor generated passwords. And then this one is going to require the user to create a new password at the next login. Or if you wanted to disable that, you can uncheck that. So you can name your user anything you want. So I have you name it to your choice. And then we wanted to make sure that we check both options. Then you are gonna click next to proceed to the permission part. And it's gonna ask you to create the group because that's the proper way to manage access is to put the user in the group and then tie a policy to that group. So we've seen this before. So what we do is we're gonna click next permission. And if I already have a group that's created with that, but if I wanna make a new group, I would go ahead and click create group. And then let's say that we say this is for lab 10 group. And you can select this right here. There are, <coughs> sorry, there are several. So if you want this user to also have access to your, your Elastic Beanstalk, you can so choose this. But make sure that you review this right here, okay? On the right, it gives you the list of privileges and permissions based on the policy. So if you scaled this out for enterprise use, you would likely have to add multiple policy here. So for our lab, we're only gonna need this part, okay? So this gives that user full access to AWS services resources. <clears throat> and we make a new group for that. We are gonna go ahead and create group. So now I have multiple groups here and it's select this for me. If it's not checked there, make sure you selected that. And then we are gonna proceed to tags, okay? Now, I didn't put down, uh, I did put down that you need to put a tag of your choice and you can do that. So, because later on you wanted to test it with AWS CLI so you can see it. So let's put the tag here. So let's say our key will be CIS30B and then so the tags could be anything, anything that would be related to that user, right? The job title, you can just say that um, manager, okay? And then for the value, this will be optional. We can just say, um, 
side one. Okay, something like that. And then we are going to click review. And so this gives us a summary of the user, the group, the policy. Okay. And since we have this person changed the password the first time, that will be change password policy there. And then the key that we set for tags. Okay. Now provisions boundary is not set. That's completely fine. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and create user. And don't close this so quickly. This is important. Okay. So here you would see your console link, like what I talked about before. Your access ID key is here. You can click this to copy it. And then I want you to open up Notepad or a text editor and you need to paste that here. So what you would do is you're gonna copy this and then paste it in here. And then you're gonna click show secret key here, copy it and then paste it. And if you wanna know the password, you can, you can click show and then be able to see the password. It's auto-generated, so it's gonna ask you to change the password as that user the first time anyways. Okay, so very important that we copy and paste the access ID to the text file. We also need to copy and paste the secret key to the text file and copy and paste the management console access key link to the text file. Okay. Don't close it yet. We're still not done. So now we're at step 24. So after you copy and paste all of these things into your text file, okay. Go ahead and click close. Now, if you wanted to look at the user, you can click on it. And I missed that step. So here we would close review and click on user account. I'll re-upload, so make sure there's changes. Okay, so once we go back and look at the user, you would have various tabs that shows the about that user account, okay? So if we click on the security credential, it would show the link it would show the ID, it shows the time that you activated and so on. And for that text file that you use to copy and paste the content, you can save it, okay? Save it to where you save the lab so that way you, you have something of a reference to go back to in case you need that user access. Now, what will happen is if we want to disable the user, see how it's active? You, if you wanted to disable the user, you just click this, okay? Okay. So 26 shows you how you can also locate access ID 
my key ID again. And th that's another way that you can find it. But the secret key only shown once because it tells you here, if you lose or forget your secret key, you cannot retrieve it. Instead, you have to create a new access key. Okay. And with that, we know that when we created the user, then we would need that, okay? If you wanted to use the old user that you created for the assignment, you just have to create the, the new access key. So if I wanted to make a new access key because I forgot the secret key, I would click that here, okay? And then it's gonna show me this again. And then it's it's going to give me a different um, access key ID. And then you can click show and then click close. Okay. So I wanted to show you that. So earlier, <clears throat> sorry, earlier I made this. And then I recreated it. So what you can do is if you wanted to make it inactive, you can just choose inactive and that would deactivate the account or the access key for that account. And then if I wanted to make the second one inactive, I can also do that too. So if you wanted to be secure where, you know, you don't want too many user accounts floating around and not being used, you can deactivate it. And then when, when you wanted to make it active again, you can just click those, okay? Now, if you click this, this allows, this will tell you, it says permanently delete access key. Any AWS API call using this key will fail before you disable the access key. Make sure that there's no longer in use. You cannot recover the access key if you delete it, okay? since I never use it. So all you have to do is to confirm the access ID. You got to type that in, right? And then once you do that, it's going to allow you to click delete. Okay. Any question? So this is the IM area of, of um, AWS. Okay, and that basically allows you to control who has access to that cloud. Now, next, we are gonna work with EC2 and EC2 allows us to use virtual machines that are on that we can initialize and, and utilize for different purposes from networking to, you know, test to. So then what we will do is when you, and you can even search here or you can click on services here, okay? So here we're gonna go ahead and click EC2 after we click services at the top. And any of the service you need, it's going to be in the included in this menu. So we're going to go ahead and click EC2. And it brings you to the dashboard. Okay, if you have instances that are running, it would show here. And the key pair created for that instance. So what happened is you have a user account to access the entire cloud on AWS. And with that, you have access to services, okay? Now, each of the service has its own portion for connectivity. And it would have its own key pairs and so on. And also, the, since it's a machine, right? It's basically a service or like a server, uh, a virtual machine, etc. 
then security groups just means that we can set up firewall rule for that. Okay. And on the right hand side, it will tell you the VPC. Okay. Now, if you scroll down, you would see the region and your zone. So you're allowed three, like what the book was saying. And this ties back to the actual location. When I created this, I had it, it had set me, it gave me Ohio but we can always change the region for our instance, okay? So each of the, the instance is gonna be your virtual machine, okay? And it tells you your region here. Okay, so coming back here, we already click EC2. We're on the EC2 console. You're gonna scroll down halfway. You're gonna see an orange drop down button. And you are gonna launch an instance. We are gonna pick one of the free tier eligible one. And since we've been working with Ubuntu server, I, and you know, I wanted to use Ubuntu, but for your other class, you know, Mr. Lee might require you to use other ones. So you, some of you are already familiar with this. So scroll down, you see this orange button, you're gonna click it and we are gonna launch an instance. Okay. So I'm gonna walk you briefly through this, but Amazon had added different instances, okay. So if you want later on, let's say that I, you know, I, what if I wanted to use a Mac OS to test something and I don't have an Apple system, then I can select that. But again, not all of them are eligible with the free tier. If they are free with the, the, the tier that you have, that means that there's no additional incurred cost. If you select something that is not in the free tier, there will be incurring costs. So when you go down, you would see you have Mac OS options, okay? You have Red Hat Linux. So for those of you who take Red Hat Linux courses at RCC and you wanted to play with it more, you can use that here. The, as you know, it's a different release than your your Ubuntu or Debian like on, on uh, Raspberry Pi. So commands are different, okay? Um, then you also have SUS, okay? Enterprise server, SUS is very popular as well. So the one that we are gonna pick is this one. Okay, and we are gonna use the x86, which means that it's Intel base. And then the other one is the ARM. Okay, so the selection that you select is gonna be 64-bit x86. You're gonna click select here. Okay, now below, right, are your Windows Server base. And there are container. There are a couple that are free and they're using Server 2019, which is very common right now. Many companies still use Server 2016 until it stopped being supported. And the data center is the highest level in the addition of the server that you can get. So with that, you can scale bigger. And then, you know, with other options, it's slightly different with the, the container. So if you wanted to manage more on, you know, storage and things like that, you wanted to select the other option. 
Okay, so as you can see there, are, and then here is your Debian 10. And you can use this right here and it has two versions for two architecture. So one is gonna be x86, that's Intel, and then the other one is gonna be ARM. And then some of the older stuff, right, 2016. Um, you are not gonna be able to find much of the SQL stuff pre. Um, there are some, but not very many, okay? So why do they have some legacy, legacy stuff on here? It's because companies still use that, right? So it's easy for migration if they still use old OS. And then on this one, this one is for with PowerShell Mono and then the .NET Core. So if you wanted to do .NET applications, then you can use this one, okay? .NET is also old, but it will be good if you wanted to test some stuff that's web-based for Windows. Um, and then when I taught this, <clears throat> when I walk over the, this last year, I had the student use this one, but that's older. So you have some options there. And then machine learning stuff is here, okay? And again, these are not free with our tier. Okay, any question with this? Okay. So once you select the x86, it's gonna give you the option to Keep default with the T1 micro free tier. That's like it selects it for you. When you select the other ones, it will not be free. Um, and then you are going to review and then you're going to launch it. I prefer that you don't change your security group for now. I wanted to make sure that you can terminal in before you started editing your security group. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna make it publicly available as long as you have the proper key pair. And so after that, you would be able to change it up where you can lock it down. But keep in mind that you have to look at the, <clears throat> the rules, okay? So some of the things that I want you to know is that it uses public IP all our web, all everything on the internet uses public IP. And you have to identify your public IP. You can do it through your router or you can do it through a website. Yep, I, I understand. Okay. No, yeah, it's not gonna give you why it's like that. It gives you a general idea. So when you have connection timeout, your security group or your ACL is the area you need to look at and your IP is where you need to look at. So how do I find my public IP, you might ask, okay? Simple, you can go where to find my public IP address, right? And it's gonna give you information like what is my IP address. And if you use who is website, it, it works too, okay? Um, and because all of this, like ip.me also works. So if you click ip.me, it's gonna show your public IP at the top. You have to use your router public IP. Not internal IP, internal IP is private and it will not work. So I think this is the area where many students get confused because they can't distinguish the IP addresses or if you lock down your stuff so tight that it would not accept SSH, okay? All right.
Any question? Okay, so let's come back to here. Okay, it's gonna select this for you. <clears throat> and then what it's gonna do is gonna do review and launch. Okay, now you can do the configuration where you can manage it, but you can always go back and configure. The whole point in this is to use your, your CLI to do it, right? So whatever you can do on the console, which is through the API, then you can you can do it in in the cli okay it just takes a little bit of work on the cli but once you get the hang of it it's not bad okay all right so here it tells me that my instance is open to the world right the instance may be accessible to from any ip address so if you want the rest of the world to connect to your machine sure open it up right but the practice is that we wanted to to whitelist to filter a certain source address where is that coming from and again i said public ip make sure that you use your public ip which is your router that's provided by your your internet service provider okay because everything gets routed from your router to the rest of the world. So, um, and then you also wanted to make sure that the port <clears throat> that you're setting it up. So for the web server, like it will use 80. And so later on, you might want it to edit your security group, but be careful when you look at that. So <clears throat> importantly, we wanted to tap this. Okay, we wanted to use SSH to connect to the EC2. So it is a server on a rack somewhere from, in my case, in Ohio, right? And I wanted to use my internet to terminal into it, meaning connect to it so I can use it, right? And that's, that's cloud, right? And we've done this forever it's just now we have companies that offer this type of service so this the source when it's zero 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 like this that would just be public but if you add your security group make sure that you have your public ip here and then you can just put a little description like you know if it's you if you if you're working from corporate office you can put hq right and so on okay launch do not close this okay so what you want to do is you are going to make a key pair okay i already have one but i'm going to make a new one okay and i'm going to call this lab 10. and with that if you already have one, you can use the existing one, but you can make a new one to test. I suggest making a new one so that way, whatever that you had in the other one that might be blocking you from connecting, you can make a new key pair, okay? And once I put in a name for my key pair, so where am I at, you might ask. Professor Wen, where are you, right? I'm right here. Step 31. So once I have the new key pair, I type it in. I wanted to download it. And very important that you don't lose the file. Okay. Because if you lose that dot pen file, your private key, you're done. <laughs> you have to make another one. Um, so here. Right, we're gonna go ahead and click download. Okay, and if you notice, I have a 
.pem file that just dropped onto my downloads folder. Okay. Then go back to the steps. Okay, I put a note there for you and then we're gonna click the launch instance. Okay, and then to view the instance. So after that, we're gonna go ahead and launch the instance. And it says that it's launching now. It might take like a, a minute to kind of just but usually it's very fast. Amazon is very, very responsive. So um, click view instance, okay. So now I have two instances, one is pending and one is running. Okay, they, see now it's running. So I have now two instances and they're both Ubuntu. One is the one I just made, okay. And then the other one here. Now, if you wanted to view it, you simply click it. So this gives you your instant ID. You can copy it, okay, if you want. It also gives you information about your <clears throat> private address, which is internally used for that server on the rack. It's public IP address, which is what's given by AWS service provider. They, they have their own, right? Um, then also your EIP is not listed here, okay? In the book, it talks, Eric Chu talks about how he would put in the EIP, right? And so you can also set that up. Your AMI, okay, information about that server, the location, okay. So all the general information that you need to be able to, to understand a little bit more about your instance is happening there, along with this security, right? As we have it not specified, you would see the port range there. So we can SSH into it now. So earlier they mentioned that if it's a web server, then you want to set up port 80 for it, right? So you would have to set up that along with some of the details for the networking and how you're gonna accept that, okay? So the interface ID is this one right here, your public address, your private address, your private DNS. Okay, all of them are part, they are servers, so there are domains and so on. So what can I do with this? Well, I can use it to host some stuff, right? Um, but then my time and my, it, you're limited to the free tier, so it's gonna be that they eventually it's gonna incur charges, okay? And then if you wanted to look at the storage, that's there. So if you wanted to do more, more monitoring stuff for the security and like, you know, packets, evaluation, processor, all of the administrator tools are here. It's fantastic, okay? It's a, it's a one-stop shop, uh, in my opinion. So managing cloud is way easier than managing all the actual physical racks and things where you have to get all the software in order to do that. So that's why companies choose something like this all the time, okay? So now, when, when you're running your services, we, you want to get into monitoring and all of that. And it keeps track of this for you. You can come back and you can audit it um, and, and so on and so on. So this is for maintenance reasons, okay? All right, um, status checks, okay? If you wanted to do some status checks, you can, but <clears throat> the actions are here, you can create some kind of alarm, 
and then that's just going to notify you or you if you wanted to, to get the reporting, which we require to do that. Okay. Any question? All right. So once you view the instance, take a screen capture, then you are going to visit putty.org. My favorite tool. Okay. And you're going to download Putty. Okay. So with Putty, you can Putty into your Raspberry Pi. You can Putty into as long as you set up the connection properly. But I'm going to show you how you can do that to your instance right now. So once you download your Putty installation file, open it up, right? So go to your downloads folder and there's the installer, double click it and then run the wizard to install. Keep everything default, that's fine, okay? So with Putty, it's gonna install two things. One is a Putty gen, which is a key generator. What Amazon gave you is a .pem, okay? We need to take that and we need to convert it. Two is an actual application for terminal connection, which is Putty itself. And you can use Putty on Linux. So um, after you install, you are gonna put in Putty Gen. Okay. And we have to set up the key first. Otherwise your Putty connection will not work. The only downside with PuTTY is that when you terminal in, your window is kind of small, okay? Um, there are other applications that you can use and you can also use OpenSSH with AWS. You, there are tons of tools and then you can use um, for, if you're connecting to a Windows instance, you can use RDP, it will work with RDP. Linux instance doesn't have RDP capability, right? So, so that's why we don't use RDP with Linux instance. RDP is proprietary to Windows environment. Okay, remote desktop protocol, which allows you to remote into the system using that protocol. It's not that safe, but you know, we use it forever. Okay. So what step am I at? I am here on step 39. Okay, that's fine. Uh, AWS actually converted it already. So step was skip for me. Okay. So if it doesn't, if it generates that for you already, that's fine. Okay. Um, depending on the, the, you know, the selection that you have when you set it up. All right. So I, I screenshot this for you. Okay. So it makes you easier. Okay. Search for Putty Gen. Open it up. Okay. You're going to select RSA and you're gonna click load button, locate the key from step 31, okay? The one that you downloaded, okay? And then you are going to find it by looking for a .pem file, okay? So RSA is already selected. We're gonna click load. You're gonna to go to your download folder. No, guess what? It doesn't show it, right? So because it's looking for PPK, you want to click all files here. And if it doesn't show up here, then you're gonna just search for .pem, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and click that, click open. So what we're doing is we're importing in, so AWS uses OpenSSH SSH2, okay? And 
the open format to use the key with putty, putty needs to convert it. So it need and it's an application, so it's it's gonna want to make it into the PPK file for itself in order to use it. If you use open SSH, you can use the dot pen. Okay. It's just pertaining to the application. So here, and if you notice your public key is gonna be here. Okay. And I want you to put in a passphrase. Okay, you can put anything you want as long as you remember it. Okay. And we can make it longer if you like, as long as you remember. Okay. All right. So we load that. We put in our passphrase, we click OK, click Save Private Key, and then you've got to give it a name, okay? And then you're going to close Putty Gen. Any question? All right. Then in your Windows search bar, so after we're done, okay, you're gonna go ahead and click close. After you're done, you are gonna search for putty again. And this time we're not using putty gen we're going to use putty. Okay, so here is putty. Now we have to make sure that we set up everything properly in order to connect. So port 22, that's for SSH. Okay. And on the left pane, make sure that you click session. Okay. Select SSH, the little radio button right here. And then what you want to do is then you're going to go down to connection. And um, for connection, sorry, one second. Sessions like SH and open connection second search for live. Okay. So for the seconds to keep alive, now if you want it to make it like longer, right? If I want it to go for more than five minutes, you just have to adjust the value here. So if you put in 300, <clears throat> right, that's going to give you five minutes because it's in seconds. So if you put in 3000, right, that's just going to give you longer time. So I'm just going to have it on for five minutes because that way you want it to time out at a certain time, so it ends the session. We don't want to keep it on forever, okay? And if, on, on the Windows side, if you're doing RDP, 
it actually have you put in the expiration or the length of that remote session also. Okay, then once we had set up the time that we need, you are going to go ahead and expand SSH. Okay, and then you are gonna go to the auth. And then you are gonna browse. And then you are gonna locate the PPK file, which it puts a little putty icon next to the name. And so, right, that's your PPK file, click open. And then go to your AWS console page, copy and paste the public DNS into the host name. Okay, so we are gonna go ahead and click open. So this right here needs to be your public DNS for your instance. So to go to your instance, okay, your public DNS is here. So take this, okay, and you can copy it by clicking this little double square. Go back to your putty, paste that here. And then click open. So this window pop up. We're going to go ahead and cache the server key. For Ubuntu server, the default username super user is Ubuntu. Then the passphrase that you made for your key. Okay, I'm in. Voila, open sesame. So you can do anything you want there. Now, you know, you can say reboot and then you have to, it's just gonna end that session. You can, you know, type in command. So that's done, okay. Question. Okay. That's fine. I just want you to make sure that you can connect to your terminal. So if you're able to connect to your, your system, then I'm okay with that. Okay. All right. When you're using AWS server, it's it's a Linux machine. Okay, all right. So you can make it shut down, right? Or you don't have to do this part, but it's gonna time out. Let's try that. And you can always restart it. Pseudo shutdown. Each, yeah. So it ended. Okay. And close on this. Any questions so far? The lab seems long, but it's not. Okay. 
So what you need to do next is you are going to work with your use the CLI with your EC2. OK. So go back to your EC2 console uh, right here. And you can always look at your instant state. I had stopped that, but I can always turn it back on. Okay, by clicking instant state, because I had it shut down earlier. Questions? Okay, so now back to our command prompt for the next step. We are going to do a AWS configure. Okay. So here is where it's going to ask for your AWS access key ID. I, mine is slightly different than yours because I, I, I use AWS to configure already. So yours, it's going to tell you, it's going to ask you to enter, input it. Okay. So remember the text file that you, you, had copy earlier your access key ID. Okay, you are going to use that here. So you just simply copy that and then in, in, input that, paste it over. It will take copy and paste. So if you do control C from the file and then paste it over. And then the secret key that you copy earlier. Okay then copy and paste it and enter that in. So after you do that, it will take a little bit, okay? But um, so I recommend that you do this part and then wait a little bit and then, you know, before you start proceeding to the rest of the AWS stuff down the line, because it takes a little bit to register, okay? So anyway, when you configure, when you say to configure a command like this, what you're doing is you are setting up, right, your access key ID that you copy your secret key from the user account that you made, right? And then you can set in your region, like what we talked about in the lecture, okay? It's gonna have all of these fields for you and then for the default format, you can have it at text or JSON or other type of format. So I chose to use JSON, JSON because it's easy for us to work with Python if you use JSON, okay? Okay, any question with those steps? So you can right now what you're doing is you're using AWS CLI to configure it. It's like clicking on the con the management console. Okay. But we don't want to do that all the time. We we can use AWS CLI because you, we, we might be using a server that that doesn't have the browser connection that would allow us to access our management console that way. We can use command line base management tool for AWS. That's what we're doing. Okay. Then once you had set up all of that, when you go into it, right, you are gonna be required to put in your, your secret key information in order to access it again. Okay. Then let's go look at our tags. Remember earlier I had you set up your tags. 
right? This one doesn't have a name. You can also give it a name. So go to your EC2. Let's go back to the dashboard. Okay. And then on the left side, you would see tags. And then you can do manage tags. Okay. I want you to take a look at this because later on, you're gonna find a step where you would put in your tag information, okay? So the, res the resource ID is these right here. Each of the instance that you create, it gives it an ID, okay? Any question? So if you want, you can copy and paste it and put it onto your text file. So that way you know what resource ID you have. So when you type in your command, you don't get confused. Okay. So in this step right here, what we're doing is we are looking at the type of instance. It might give you the return reservation as blank, okay? When you use this command in the, the AWS, if it gives you a blank container, that means that you didn't have a proper name, uh, the reservation name tied to it. But that's okay. I want you to just, you know, tell me what you receive, right? So if you receive like a double square brace or the square brace at the end, that just means that, that your instance reservation information is not complete. If you had set up all your instance with the details, it would give you, you know, the ID, the resources ID that you, you have, okay? So it should be matching if you receive the ID. That's the point of doing step 67 and 68. Then for step 69, okay. Sorry, I've been on my computer all day long. All right, let me quit. Okay, and then uh, you are gonna go back to your command prompt and then you are gonna use AWS EC2, create tags, resources, tags, and then you're gonna give it a name. Just like what we did earlier, when we put in the tag key, key should be about a, a description about that particular resource, right? And then the value. So here, you the highlighted in, in baby blue, you would put in your resource ID for that instance, the name that you want for that instance um, or the description and then the value. You can say like Ubuntu 20, um, you know, and then you can say Linux instance, something like that for here. All right. Then step 70, you are going to look it up. So after the difference between this one and the next one is this one allows you to create the tags. The step 70 allows you to find it or filter it, okay? So after you create it, there is a little bit of lag I'm gonna tell you that it does it might not register right away, right? Instead using the CLI. Um, however, you know, if you're getting like not found, it's just that means that it's not recording it that that instant that you you change. Okay. The information that you updated with the tags, it might not take right away. But if you come back to it, you know, give it a little bit of time, it will record because it's, <clears throat> it's via the internet, it's not going to be real time. Okay, 
So there's a little bit of latency. So I just want to let you know. Okay. All right. Okay. Take a screen capture for me. Then once you get there, what you're going to do is um, go back to your instance. Okay. And then if you want it to stop, you simply, you simply um, click on it or click on the instant state and then stop instance. So if you worry about people connecting to your stuff, this is what you do is turn it off, right? And it also doesn't incur additional or charges to your time. So if you don't use it, turn it off, right? For your simple basic security practice, right? I had it wide open, so I normally would turn off my instance if I don't use it. Okay, so now um, Amazon has really great, if you just search for CLI, okay, Amazon has really great tutorial for you to use. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this onto your chat. So in the case, if you wanted to do more with it. Okay. So when I get here, I can go ahead and look at get started and it's going to take me to the user guide. Okay. And that user guide walks you through. We talked about this earlier before at the beginning of the session, but um, we, so the configuration, the zone, all of that stuff is happening here. Environment variables, all of that, I walk you through that here, okay? So if you wanted to use it effectively, go to using AWS CLI, and you can, down, you can look at, you know, get the Kindle version, whatever you want there. But um, if you look at the command structure, You have all of these little step, right? And then you can copy and paste it. So if you wanted to make it wait, you can do that. Um, you know, uh, let's say you wanted to auto prompt something, you want to specify parameter values. If you wanted to create the key pair, like what Michelle was saying earlier, yeah, you can make a key pair in CLI. It's like whatever you can click, you can you can use command line. That's the whole point in this. Okay. Now, writing the Python program to be able to talk to this is what the author was illustrating, but he was using it with his network services. So, um, you know, if you look at the, the textbook and the information that's provided in the notes, uh, he talks about how he would set up his AWS CLI to have certain things and then correlate that to what he would write with the Python so that way it would automate it. Because we don't want to enter stuff into command line every single time. You can write a Python file and be able to fill that in. Or if you, know, if you use bash, you can make a bash file. Um, similar, but not exactly the same script. Okay. And AWS supports Bash Shell as well. So, and I hope that this gives you at least, you know, a taste of AWS CLI it, it, and, and it helps you connect to your instance and be able to get the very basic level. But it's just so a lot of the stuff is, is available resources and, and so on, so on. So refer to their guide and like I said it's not it might not match a hundred percent um but it's going to be like 95 percent close to what you need um so their documentation is actually great 
And if you want to, you can also pursue certification with AWS. And that will help with your career because you know, they are the one of the most affordable solution in the cloud that you see. Okay. All right. Any questions? So no more struggle with connecting to your instance. Um, Okay. All right. And that's it for me today. Um, I don't have office hours after this. You're welcome. I'm glad. Um, because I have advisory committee meeting, right? Uh, it's just meeting all day long. Um, I move my office hours. I post an announcement for that. If you sign up for skill sets, um, they have released your PIN for your student dashboard. I tried to get them to give me the management dashboard. They haven't responded. Um, but take make use of it. You know, go through. There are great. So it gives you like library card access, meaning that you can pick a class. And then it, they're short and sweet. So you can go through. It kind of prep you for, you know, different type of certifications. And then when you're done, you can pick another class. So it's like borrowing a book from a library. So that's what they call library card access. Yep. All right, awesome. Okay, so type your name into the chat. I wish you have a wonderful afternoon. I will post the video as soon as it's ready. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Office hours is moving to the afternoon tomorrow and hopefully they don't have any emergency stuff. Thank you, have a great weekend. I will see you next week, bye.